Anyway. So, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. So, this is about creative coding and the size optimization. Um, yeah, so I'm Mathieu T1 Henry. Uh, you can find me there, uh, www.t1.org. I work for Apostle Square and on the developer tool called Pyrofly. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And uh, I really like to do tiny, tiny stuff, tiny stuff. But uh, let's rewind a bit 30 years back. Uh, Perfect. Is that better? Yes. So rewinding 30 years back, uh, I grew up in this tiny, tiny place uh, surrounded by yeah, forest and uh, not many things else. Um, but one cool thing about uh, this place called Bayeval is that there was a computer club. Um, and uh, yeah, it was the time of uh, Tron, the first short movie from Pixar. Uh, the VIC-20, that was before the Commodore 64, the Amstrad CPC, yeah, these computers. Uh, it was also a time of the first computer graphics uh, conferences like Seagraph and uh, Imagina, if you know them. Uh, it was really, very really inspiring, but uh, I mean, with computers like this, it was completely out of reach. So, yeah, there was this computer club in uh, Bayeval. Uh, I was going there every week, uh, every Saturday. And uh, one cool thing about it is that the staff was making the kids program for like half an hour or one hour before they, they went crazy and played bubble bubble for hours. And uh, yeah, it was creative coding right off the bat. Uh, so for instance, we would teach us how to draw one line, just move to one point and draw to the next one. And the kids would do something like this. Um, then the next week they would teach us if you move to some place and do a fill, you can do a fill and yeah, and area with one color, and the kids would do something like this. It was pretty cool. Um, so it was it was a fun way to learn. Um, you just get something quickly on the screen, you play fiddle, and you learn something on the way. It, I did that for a few years, and then I stumbled onto that sort of things, uh, the demo scene. Uh, so this is the Union demo in uh, February 89. And one crazy, crazy thing, uh, if you see the mouse cursor here, do, do, do. That's the physical resolution. And what happened is there's things going on on the side. <laughs> um, so these guys, we managed to just push the boundaries. They just did things that um, the manufacturers of the computer thought were impossible. And then suddenly things were becoming more interesting. So it was all about pushing the platform, uh, just taking the constraints of your platform as an opportunity to think differently and try try new things. Um, for instance, you just have 16 colors. No way. You can't do colors every scan line eh, as soon as you want. And you can get thousands of, hundreds of thousands of colors. Well, if you have only three of your channels and you want to do eight channels, well, mix them in software. You can do it. It's no problem. What if you don't have audio? What if you are on a ZX80 and there's no audio chip? Well, you have something that makes sounds. It's called a floppy disk. You just seek on the floppy like a madman, and the motors will squeal. And you can make music, like real music with that. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, doing this kind of demo is, yeah, takes some time, it takes a long time. And uh, this day with this cute little one, I don't have much of that. So I prefer to focus on making small things, like shiny things, quickly, like GS1K, 140 bytes, and small intros, like in the demo scene spirit. Like really trying to pack as much bang in little, little bites. Uh, so yeah, careful. It's about to get dirty, real dirty. So yeah, this thing. Uh, well, it was my last entry at the uh, one k uh, I'm not sure we'll be able to hear much, but. Uh, can you hear? It's a yeah, speech synthesizer in nine hundred bytes. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and since it was in uh, audio elements, you can play with a uh, with a volume, replay it, and blah, blah, blah. Um, also about some things. It's a major sponge in 511 bytes. Uh, it can be optimized a lot more. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Doesn't matter. Um, or yeah, this thing was pretty old. It's like eight years old now. Uh, it's a model board tracer that zooms and rotates in ASCII. Uh, 256 bytes. Oh, uh, that's yeah. A uh, Sudoku solver in 140 bytes. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that I like the most about this one is how I just stop the recursion. I just throw an exception. Uh, this is from uh, Felix Nias. Uh, it just tries to access uh, unreferenced uh, variables and just throws. And then you end up with a solution of your Sudoku. Uh, last thing I did is a retraced checkboard in 128 bytes. Like this. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but yeah, there's many, many tricks and different tricks based on your target size. Um, yeah. 512 bytes is a, like one benchmark uh, size, I would say. Um, how do you get there? Well, obviously, you don't use white space, semicolon, just <laughs> remove that. The loops, yeah, just use for loops. Uh, they are far more versatile than while loops, and you can do tons of stuff in them. And at worst, they are as big as a while, so why bother? Um, quarks mod is your friend, obviously. I mean, you see this thing, uh, but basically it's HTML with a one canvas with an ID D, uh, C, and you just want to get the 2D context, it's 90 bytes. Doing that in quarks mod, it's 48. Yeah, win. Uh, if you want to execute some code on load, well, there's different ways. Um, you just have a script tag and you put your code, it's 21 bytes or if you can just put a body element with a inline javascript on the node and it's 18 bytes three bytes shorter uh, set intervals well why would you declare a function like this i mean it's just stupid it's 35 bytes you can do it in 10 bytes less uh, the dom of doom like if you want to create elements like what the hell is that like 51 bytes just just in your html the whole thing 27 bytes like half the size um yeah, yeah, again, dome of doom. <laughs> you want to touch the dome, append some element or anything? Yeah, it's using HTML. It's a short one. Uh, the, the append child version was 18. Uh, inner HTML one is 15. Like, yeah. Uh, of course, there's, uh, yeah, you can alias uh, methods and use with. So this little snippet there, uh, it's basically a rotation. Uh, rotate of x, y uh, okay. by an angle a. Uh, yeah, and I messed up, uh, should be seen and seen, but yeah, whatever. Uh, so this thing uh, with our optimization is 60 bytes. If we just alias math, uh, it's 55. If we alias smite or cos and math sin, it's 54, so six bytes less. And with a width, we go down to 50. It's not too bad, 10 bytes shorter. Um, of course, there's yeah, unused arguments in many methods. Um, yeah, this example, uh, do, do, do. yeah, that's when you draw an image and then you try to get the data, one pixel of it. Well, you can just, uh, since the draw image returns undefined, it's fine to use in instead of zero here, and you save two bytes. Well, when you're, yeah, when you're trying to squeeze something into 128 bytes, it's every byte counts. So you really have to go dirty. Uh, yeah, coercion. Uh, yeah, we do that all the time, like yeah, variable and like a fallback with a double pipe. Well, the uh, well arrays, uh, when something is indefined and uh, you access the array, you get the two string version and uh, it goes to empty string. So again, you save two bytes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, false entropy. Yeah, we all know that. Uh, so do do do. What is this one? Uh, yeah, if you test something that is equal to zero. Well, yeah, test it, test it directly. There's no need to check this part that it is different than zero because it is trophy. Just put the whole thing directly. And it is five bytes shorter. Uh, magic numbers, yeah, I love them. Uh, so yeah, there's the, yeah, the obvious one, uh, math the floor. Uh, that is 13 bytes, and you just do a 
a binary or with zero, which does not affect the well the value, but just cast it to integer. Uh, it doesn't work so well for negative numbers, but yeah, who cares? I mean, <laughs> you're just trying to do yeah something cool. I'm sure you will find a way to yeah to do without negative numbers. Uh, dirty trigonometry. That's right. so cool. Um, yeah. So basically, when you want to do like things that spins around and yeah, draw stuff, you always have to deal with pi and fractions of pi. Uh, a common one is yeah, pi over two, uh, which you can use to make a sinus out of cosinus. And uh, if you look at your know, value eight modulo pi two uh, times two, uh, it's actually pretty close to pi over two. Uh, and the error is 0 0.14. So if you're really short of bytes, uh, you can use you know, math.py over two, which is nine bytes, or you can use eight, which is just one. And uh, in the example of a rotation from before, it was 50 bytes with a with math uh, using yeah, cos and sin. But if you just alias math.cos and use this eight, this magic eight, suddenly it's three bytes short now. Again, useful. Um, similar, um, 89 and the one are pretty close to pi over three. Uh, 89 is has an error of uh, 0 0.01, which is pretty good. But if you're really, really, really short of bytes, you can use one and the error is 0 0.05. That's acceptable, I guess. Um, Math that pi over three counts for nine bytes and yeah, these two, two and one. So that's worth it. Uh, same story, um, minus pi over 2, uh, it's pretty close to 11 or minus 8, since we saw that 8 is close to pi over 2. Uh, but 11 is much, much more precise. It has an error of only 0 0.004, uh, while minus 8 has an error of 0.14. So it's a very good approximation. Um, 22, yeah, we all know that 22 over 7 is pi-ish. <laughs> Uh, the error is 0 0.008, that's pretty good. And uh, yeah, again, seven bytes against two. So if you are short, you, know, you can use this trick, it's fine. No one will notice. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you know, obviously <laughs> 22 is about pretty close to pi, so 44 is pretty close to two pi. And uh, the error is quite small, I don't know if you can see it, it's uh, 0 0.01, uh, which gives us a period of 178 iterations before you actually loop around, which, that's not bad. Uh, and, uh, doo -doo -doo, yeah. and um, 44 modulo 2 pi is more or less 0 0.03, um, and yeah, that is 7 bytes, uh, using 44 it's 1 byte short now, so again, it's worth it. Uh, floating point sucks, yeah, we all know that. Uh, we've seen, yeah, uh, Crockford talking about it. Uh, yeah, when you do 0.1 plus 0.2, it's 0.3, blah, something. Uh, that's, well, that's normal, it's part of a uh, floating points uh, uh, IE standard, um, which is based, obviously, on binary, uh, so it can only do, well, powers and negative powers of two. So, yeah, obviously, that sucks when you do that, but you can use that. Um, because sometimes floating points rocks. For instance, you have a loop uh, on something, and you want to do something every well point. If you just increase your your number by a negative power of two, or yeah, or inverse power of two, one over thirty-two in that case, it will only fall on the round, yeah, round floating number. Which means you will never get these funky, yeah, funky values of three zero 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 four, whatever. There's no error with that. There's no floating point error, and then that allows you to make sure that your number, the, the increment, falls on, well, on actually integers. In that case, there's i that is decrementing from forty two by one over thirty two each time, and every time the modulo of i. Uh, I modulo three is trophy. I just do sh something shiny, and when it's faulty, I just uh, put a br, which means that there will be three times thirty-two shiny things, and then a br, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. That means that I can fill basically a, a text area with that, 
um, yeah, it's pretty short, like yeah, 46 bytes. If I had to make a counter and check, okay, I did already 30 times, uh, 32 times three increments, and insert the beer, and psh, then reset the counter, and like yeah, yeah, it's way too long. And this this abuse of or this tricky use of floating numbers is really helpful. So if we want to go beyond 512 bytes, um, yeah, we saw these very, very dirty tricks. Um, yeah, when you go beyond 512 bytes, you start to use libraries or APIs, and then, yeah, you see that the method names are really long. So it's pretty, well, it's a good idea to hash them, to shorten them in a mechanical way, uh, and make sure that the ones you need uh, don't collide, that you don't get a hash that collides. You, you're hashing uh, the magic part here. It doesn't have to be absolutely unique. It just has to be unique enough so that you have a short name that is unique for the methods you need. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> this was uh, this one was introduced by uh, Marin uh, Marin Averberke uh, in uh, Guess One K uh, One. Yeah, it's uh, it's even slightly shorter this version. Um, he well, he needed to use the two D canvas context, and it was way too long. Uh, so he just did this hashing that looks like the name of uh, all the method names and kicks the first character and the seventh if it exists. Uh, if it doesn't exist, it will be just empty string and just the first character. And that turns, yeah, the method name like fill right into FC and quadratic curve to blah into QT and remix to GM. That's yeah. A lot shorter. Like just in that example, uh, in these three method names, you go from 42 to 15 bytes, like 27 bytes more. Or less. And you have a lot more of this in your in your code. Um, we can do a sample work here. Uh, well, uh, I did it. Uh, I'm not the only one, but uh, yeah. yeah. So um, this works really good, and it's unique enough uh, to basically initialize uh, initialize WebGL and the shader so that you just have like one massive triangle that covers the whole viewport and one pixel shader or one fragment shader. Uh, so that's, it's yeah unique so that you have all the methods you need and at most they are five characters long. So it covers things like, well, yeah, let's see the hashing. Um, it just takes the first two arguments, uh, the first two uh, letters, then it, it keeps all the uppercase and since I needed to keep uh, the methods related to uh, uniforms with just one float, uh, like uh, the uniform, the variable that was giving the time of my yeah, my demo is running, uh, I just needed to keep everything that has one float at the end. So that was okay. So I just match everything, and I join I join all these characters with empty string, and that's the hashing. So it turns things like compile shader into yeah, COS, uh, enable vertex array attribute, uh, which is yeah, a mouthful, into MDA. Uh, yeah. So we go from 70 bytes for these three methods down to 21. That's yeah, almost 50 bytes improvement. That's pretty good. Um, then, yeah, there's JAS packers, obviously. Um, the basic idea of JAS packers, uh, you probably saw them. It's just to go through your, your code, look for uh, strings that are repeated often and that yeah, that have a big impact and replace them by a token, a short token, like dollar, uh, non-printable character, and then you reverse that. Um, so JAS packers basically build one string and then they just look for the tokens, look for the corresponding uh, substring that it replaces, then do all the replacement, and then it evaluates the source code. Uh, that is my unpacker, which is, uh, yeah, in its shortest form, like 68 bytes. Um, so what it does is, yeah, in the dollar, there's the packed source code, and at the end, there is uh, the token and the string that it replaces. So in the test condition of my loop, I just do a simple match. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll just do a, a single match for one of the tokens here using a regex. Uh, and ideally, you would use a, a range, a regex range, where you just, well, 
even better, you would use non-printable characters from like uh, zero one down to as everything you can. Um, in the Wolf 1K, which was um, yeah an attempt to make a 3D FPS in the one kilobyte of JavaScript, I managed to not use any character until the ASCII character 37. So no white space, no quotes, no exclamation mark, and so on. Just to optimize this part. And it, yeah, it worked. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just find one token. Then you go, 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 go. You shift, uh, well, you, yeah, first you split in the, in the body of the four. Yeah, in the body of four, you split on the token that you found. And then you join using the shift, using the beginning of the array. So first you have the, the array, then the token, and then the packed code. So you split on the token, you get the, the substring that it replaces at the beginning, and then you just join with it. And that's using uh, what I said above at, uh, well, to nest all the calls together. And uh, well, eventually the match, uh, looking for your tokens will not match and will just execute a loop. And we evaluate the code and voila. So that's that's it for yeah, just trackers. Uh, and for yeah, about 512 bytes up to maybe 1K, that works okay, these things. But uh, if you want to go beyond 1K, uh, you need something a bit, a bit better than this. Um, and there is something called ZLib. <laughs> that works pretty good. Um, and it's used in browsers, actually. Um, it's used in, well, in PNG images. Yeah. PNG images are basically a Z, uh, well, ZLib. Uh, the data. Uh, also, it makes it easier to handle binary data and non-printable characters because we, this can be a little bit tricky in, uh, in JavaScript. So what you do is you shove your JavaScript into, or you treat your JavaScript as the pixel of an image, and then you load that into your, your favorite editor and save that as a PNG. You crunch it as much as you want, and then you load the image uh, and read the pixels. Uh, this technique was uh, well, discovered by Jacob Sedelin um, in 2008, I believe, uh, when, yeah, basically, as soon as we had get image data, we just poof, jumped on it. And that was a yeah, very smart thing to do. Uh, that's his initial code, uh, slightly optimized. It's about 250 bytes. It loads one PAG. Uh, well, it creates an image here, loads an image, and in the onload event, we get we create an empty string, build a canvas element, create the to-do context, I'll get the to-do context, read the pixels, uh, do, 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 yeah, read the pixels, um, well, the data obviously, and then we just loop around uh, through all the pixels of that image. Um, and we just yeah, concatenate the string from car code of that, yeah, that pixel. And at the end, we just evaluate the code. It's pretty nice, but uh, yeah. Well, it's a little bit big, like 200 something bytes. Uh, it's a bit annoying to use locally. You have to enable or to allow your web browser to access local files. Um, uh, for instance, at least in Chrome, you have to. Uh, it's a bit, yeah, it's not cool. Um, so, well, yeah, it, it works really good. Uh, it was basically a state of the art until recently, until a couple of months ago. And now, uh, yeah, that is, where is the shiny things? PNG bootstrapping. Um, Basically, uh, you yeah, you abuse PNGs, uh, the PNG file format, and the way it's loaded in web browsers. And one thing, uh, web browsers usually they are served crap from the web servers, so they all they don't trust the content that is sent to them. They have to read like the first 64k and check the content and guess what it is. And uh, well, if you do, if you serve them something like this, <laughs> shiny.pg.html and there ha happens to be some text in it, they will think it's HTML, and they will execute that HTML code. Uh, this was uh, discovered by Cody daiken uh, who works at Mozilla and uh, Boot2Gecko. Gecko. This guy is a genius. <laughs> so yeah, browsers try to get the content type of resources based on some data that they load from them. Uh, also, one cool thing uh, is that, like for many formats, uh, the, the Implementation of a supporting one format 
is often a little bit dodgy or not dodgy, but it's like, yeah, it works, but uh, don't look too much into the details. For instance, uh, you can cut the last chunk uh, of a PNG image. Uh, it's basically a chunk that says, well, that's the end of the image and it costs 12 bytes. Uh, you can also cut off uh, uh, the checksums at four bytes and browsers don't care about it. They don't look at it. So you gain like 16 bytes for nothing. Uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, PNG bootstrapping looks a bit like this. Um, it's basically your PNG image, and you had you put this code at the end of your PNG image, and success. Uh, the, yeah, it's really really yeah, nifty. Um, so basically, before that, the dragons and PNG image, and here is HTML code that will be passed as HTML by the web browsers. Uh, it works across all browsers. Uh, I tried it. Yeah, I got it to work in Opera, Safari, WebKit, uh, well, Chrome, and uh, Firefox. Um, so at the end of your PNG image, you put a canvas element, uh, an image tag, and uh, yeah, the funny thing is, well, the HTML is the image, and the image is the HTML. So how do you reference the image? Well, you just use the fragment you had. You just do the source of the image, it calls hash, and that reference itself, and it just loads itself, and, and it's there. <laughs> and uh, that way also browsers don't complain about accessing local files because well, it's already in memory. Um, so yeah, you just use or well, inline your JavaScript, uh, that will get the 2D context of the canvas that you have here, uh, which you can access easily or quickly since it is quirks mode, and then you yeah, you loop over uh, the body, or the body, the condition of the loop is basically uh, you draw one pixel. Uh, yeah, you, you don't need to know the size of a PNG image. You just have a counter and you just draw the whole thing towards the right. Oh, well, yeah, towards the left. Uh, yeah, so you don't need to know. If it's your PNG image and your code is in one single line, you just draw until you hit uh, zero. Um, so you basically draw image horizontally. You get the image data of starting from zero, zero, just one pixel, and you access the data the first component, uh, and that should be the ASCII character of your JavaScript code. And you end with a zero, and when you have a zero, it just ends. And the body of the loop just had the string from car code of that, that value. And at the end, you just eval and win. And this bootstrapping is around five, uh, no, five, 155 bytes. So you just get your PNG image, remove CRC, remove high end chunk, you gain 16 bytes, and then you add these 155 bytes, and you have a self executing PNG. Yep. And uh, that would be about it. So, yeah, kudos to some web world size coders, uh, well, Daikan, Gasman, CB, Neologic, and uh, Marine, who, yeah all came up with uh, various crazy ideas, like the PNG bootstrapping using PNGs to compress JavaScript data, um, Marine for the, for the hashing, and uh, CB uh, who wrote a tool to actually, uh, a, well, command line tool for Windows or DOS. Uh, you pass it a JavaScript file and it runs a PNG out. Uh, well, it runs like three different uh, PNG conchas in different types, try to have your code uh, normal mode or reversed, and then it uses different bootstrappings and it generates like crazy, crazy short bootstraps. Gasman did uh, similar tools in Ruby, and uh, well, they can with came up with uh, the ID. And uh, well, we all work together to optimize the bootstrapping, and uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty good now. So that's about it. And uh, well, thank you very much. And don't forget Demo.js on uh, June 2030. They have a 1K competition and they allow remote entries. Uh, so feel free to apply any of this technique and uh, submit your entry in the 1K compo. Right. Uh, Mike? We got plenty of time for questions, yeah. if you have any. Uh, uh, can I start? Yeah. Uh, just an idle question. Has Douglas Crockford ever tried to kill you in a screaming rage? Sorry? <laughs> Has Douglas Crockford ever tried to kill you? No, uh, I saw him a couple of times at uh, 
at Opera Software uh, for some like, TC39 meetings. Yeah. Well, he hasn't actually seen your code. No, I don't think don't so. Don't show uh, your code. Yeah, Trust it would be me. dangerous. OK, questions? No questions. Oh. That's one. <laughs> Since you brought up evil, uh, have you, uh, are there any known exploits that any of these techniques have been used for? Like the, the stashing stuff in PNGs feels like there's a hint of an exploit going on there. Yeah, it feels a bit hicky. Uh, I, well, I'm sure, I mean, you can exploit it. I mean, yeah. uh, I've not tried to load that into an image tag and then to see if there's the HTML or JavaScript is executed. I would be surprised. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, one thing that I did was um, Defender with Avicom a few years back, uh, which was basically rendering a canvas game, uh, a remake of Defender into a canvas and then getting the data URL and setting that as the Favicon. So you could play a little game in the Favicon with your browser. Uh, that was sweet, <laughs> but uh, then a few months later, um, Azar Raskin uh, came up with the idea of tap napping, which is basically you are on a website and you just Browse something else, and after two minutes, that website changes the URL, changes a bit, uh, uh, changes the layout, changes the favicon, and to try and fish you, but you're on Gmail and you have to log in. And that is exactly the same thing. And I was like, oops, <laughs> didn't think of that. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess there's similar exploits possible. And, um, well, there's something ticking in my head um, the, the abuse of PNG. I guess it's possible to abuse web files or audio formats in a similar manner. So I'm curious to try that. Okay, any more? Uh, going once, going twice. Okay, then you can take a break. I think it's about time. Uh, we are a bit ahead of schedule, so.